Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tinkser. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders in the hospitality and restaurant industry to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind that both employees and customers love and support. In this episode, I was very lucky to have a conversation with Charlie McWay, who is a known investor in the hospitality and restaurant industry here in the UK. Investor and judge on the TV show, The Million Pound Menu, chairman for The Breakfast Club, as well as Butch buttermilk fried chicken. We talked about his journey in hospitality. We talked about leadership, the state of the industry, going abroad as an operator, investment, and the importance of net profit, and why he's very optimistic for the future of our beloved industry. So get coffee, notebook, and enjoy. I'm very excited to present you for today's podcast guest on the Hospitality Maverick podcast. I'm sitting here in the middle of Soho on election day with Charlie McVay. Welcome to the podcast, Charlie. Thank you for having me. And uh, you've been busy today. <laughs> been in a three hour brand presentation before I came here, which was uh, terrific. And I'm um, trying not to think about the election. It's no, no. We, objective. We, and we've, we've already agreed we're not talking about it. We can't talk <laughs> politics on the Hospitality Maverick podcast. You're absolutely right. Because politics is not something we can do much about. We can talk about how we can change the world from the hospitality and restaurant industry Correct. point of view instead. Correct. So for the people that shouldn't know who Charlie McRae is, can you just give a brief summary about who you are? Who I am. Yeah, and what you've been up to and what you've done and how did what you're focusing here? on. How did we get here yeah, today? Yeah. So I was born in New York, moved to London when I was eight. My parents are American. I went to school here all the way through and university. I then became a financial journalist and then a management consultant. And that took me up until I was around just 30, I think. 30 years old. I found myself living in the Far East in between Guangzhou in China and Manila in the Philippines. Bizarrely, I was doing a project as a management consultant for Procter & Gamble. And I sort of really was living in hotel rooms and traveling from place to place, feeling very sort of rootless and disconnected. I started to, for the first time, really feel that I wanted to come home and do something that was more rooted where I'm from. And at that time, I came back, bumped into some friends in, in London. We stayed up very late drinking. We ended up in, a, in an after-hours bar in Westbourne Grove, an old Greek restaurant called Angelo's, which isn't there anymore. We were downstairs having, having an illegal beer at sort of one or two in the morning, and we came to the conclusion that it was ridiculous that Notting Hill didn't have a decent nightclub. And the three of us old friends decided that we would set up a nightclub in Notting Hill. We didn't have any idea how that might happen, but that was the sort of germ of my entry in, into hospitality. And the next day, I, you know, the other two ran away. In fact, they did get back involved at a later stage. They were obviously hung over and not that interested in talking about opening a nightclub, but me being sort of persistent and with a few weeks to go before I had to go back to uh, the Far East I, I rang a friend, in fact the father of a friend of mine who was in the property business and said, you know, I want to buy a nightclub, you know, how do I do that? And he said, well I'm selling a nightclub do you want to buy it? This is the only call I made uh, and, and I said, well, which which one is it? Uh, and he said, it's 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 the old Woody's nightclub in Woodfield Road, which is just by Westbourne Park Tube on the Hammersmith City Line. It's sort of in the northern part of what's you know, loosely called Notting Hill. So I bought it and uh, it was very cheap. It was a freehold, cost 600 grand. And I borrowed the money and I quit my job and came home and started refurbishing. It had been closed for three or four years. They had been planning to turn it into flats and the numbers on that project, I think, hadn't stacked up. And so I ended up owning this thing. And, and then actually the other two, hungover boys came back in and put a bit of money in and the three of us were the shareholders in, in, in this nightclub. We reopened it, we decided to keep the name Woody's because we'd all gone there actually as kids and hung out. It was much seedier then. We opened something that was probably regrettably a little bit more sophisticated. Anyway, it was a huge success. After an initial period of really having no idea how to make money out of it, we, we really started to make quite a lot of money out of it. That sort of began a, a little mini expansion where we bought the pub next door Again, a freehold. Um, we bought a big restaurant, an old milk bottling factory in, in Shepherd's Bush. It was a, just a period of time when the freehold market in West London hadn't really caught up with the residential market and you were able to buy things very cheaply. We sort of ran those businesses profitably and happily and then kind of really sparked by the fact that I was turning 40 in 2007, I decided to sell the nightclub and then I decided well, I might as well sell everything. So we sold everything, all the freeholds, just, just as the market was about to sort of completely go down the pan. There was no wisdom in it. It was just really because I didn't think it would be wise to own a nightclub age 40. And I, I, I sort of felt like I'd, I was no longer in touch with our customer who was, you know, 
by this stage much younger than me. So we sold them, we sold them very well, and then the world fell apart. But meanwhile, I had a pub in Battersea, which was a leasehold, and I hadn't really owned a leasehold before, didn't really understand leaseholds, I didn't realize sort of how onerous they were. Unlike the three freeholds, the pub was really unsuccessful, and it was a sort of a disaster, really. It was my own, it, the other two weren't involved. I'd done this as a personal mm. project, and it was, disappointingly, it was losing money hand over fist. So uh, I had to make a decision, and meanwhile, the whole world was falling apart. You know, I had yeah. to make a decision about, you know, whether I was going to keep it or whether I was going to reinvent it. And at the time, it'd been one of the managers at the nightclub who was Italian had persuaded me that what London really needed was an Italian pub and in fact there is now an Italian pub group in London but this was before craft beer or anything else and it was sort of an odd idea and as it turned out not a good idea when I sold the other three businesses I had to decide whether to sell that one and I decided because I was stubborn I decided that I would keep it and try and reinvent it and, and do something new and one of the managers from one of the three businesses I was selling he was a beer nut and he sort of got me into mm. beer and we both sort of started getting interested in these in these new beers that were coming over from the States and there was just starting to be some some of the new breweries were opening in, in, in London but I mean there was no such thing as craft beer most pubs still sold cooking lager you know lager you saw on TV that coincided so I started having that sort of conversation and, and, and started sort of getting interested in beer and then this guy walked into our disastrous pub and said uh, my name is Duncan Sandbrook and I'm opening a brewery behind your pub, literally right behind. So clear-eyed, rugby-playing engineer who'd got a first from Cambridge and was sort of super bright and had been a, an accountant at one of the big four. He was probably one of the very first of those kind of people to throw in the towel as a professional and go and open a brewery, which has now become a very well-trodden path yeah. uh, in the UK yeah, and yeah, elsewhere definitely. in the world. There were no customers, so we locked up the pub and we walked around the back and had a pint of the beer that he was brewing, which later became known as Sandbrook's Wandle, which is was one of the sort of iconic early beers and the, in what became the craft beer um, revolution in London and, and Duncan and I became firm friends and it, it was just another thing that was sort of pointing us in the direction of doing something interesting with beer. So that pub we closed and, and we spent no money on it, we painted it ourselves and all the rest and we reopened it as a kind of beer focused pub where we were celebrating you know, local and international beers of quality, not yet known as craft beer. The pub gradually started attracting more and more customers and kind of nice customers who were interested in the same sort of people who would have been interested, say, in the provenance of food or stories about wine, you know, were also turned out were, of course, were interested in stories about beer and interesting beers and nice labels and, you know, fun stuff around beer. And this was happening at the same time as, say, the Rake in, in uh, Borough Market and a few other of those early pubs yeah. that focused on beer. It became really a, quite a big success. I had a friend of mine who worked in advertising, probably 2008 now, probably 18 months we've been running what was then called the Westbridge Public House and Dining Rooms quite successfully. And, and this lady had come in from Westfield in Shepherd's Bush. She said, you know, I come to your pub a lot. From the, I really the like shopping centre. Yeah, yeah, from the shopping centre, yeah. And she, she said, you know, I come to your pub a lot. I'm a regular... I said, yes, I know, I recognize you. She said, I want you to open a pub in Westfield. I was like, okay, sounds good. So I, I rang up my friend who's in advertising and, and said, look, well, I think we need to create a brand here. We're doing something interesting and clearly other people think it's interesting and it'd be great to create something that sort of symbolized kind of warm welcome, great beer, simple food, but, you know, really a focus on good times and great beer. So we sort of kicked around a lot of ideas and we, 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 we had this vision of our customer in Westfield and we, we imagined this sort of strident woman walking through Westfield with a sort a slightly disconsolate looking husband trailing along behind not really wanting to be in Westfield at all uh, and and we we thought well it, well given that it's probably quite a transient population of customers we need to have a, a name for the business that does what it says on the tin so we came up with this name the draft house and um, we thought that if you were that husband and you're walking along and you saw this place called the draft house and sort of had great beer in it you would then decide oh maybe I'll just let the wife carry on and I'm just going to go in here quietly and have a few pints and read the paper and th this is in the days of newspapers uh, <laughs> stare at my phone in, in the modern yeah. world yeah and then we we got to the end of 2008 and you know we were about to sign this lease with Westfield and then we didn't quite get it over the line had some investors lined up and you know didn't didn't quite get it over the line it was a massive site 7,000 square feet you know it was going to wow. cost a wow. lot of money to do didn't get it done and segue into January 2009 when we, we already thought the world was falling apart but in January 2009 for those of you who are too young to remember it was like a, a cataclysm and we were staring into the abyss and all the investors ran away and uh, nobody wanted to do anything everyone thought Westfield was going to go bust because they were, had a lot of debt so the idea of doing a, a pub in a in a Westfield shopping centre was, was, was a non-starter so, yeah. so we ended up buying a 
tiny little site in, in an old picture and piano site in um, Northcote Road in, in Clapham, which became the first draft house, and we rebranded the second one, and da da da, and it went on from there. And but that, that so that was really how I got started on multi-site. Maybe it was a bit of luck then that uh, you didn't get the Westfield one because that was quite a, a beast to take up. That's what I thought at the time, but the truth is, is that the the recession in London was it didn't ever never really happened. It was more of a mood thing. I think the rest of the country did suffer hugely, but I think London actually the data shows carried on growing mm. throughout Geronimo Inns which later got bought by Young's who who took the site I mean it did 60,000 pounds a week for them it was a fantastic okay. site yeah. so so actually contrary to your point I generally cite it as one of my great mistakes not mm. persevering with this with this site but at the time it seemed actually it's probably not possible because yeah. no you know unless you unless you were a large company and you you, you had a you know longer term vision it would have it, it seemed insane I guess there was no way in reality we would have done it but had we had it, it would have been a, an amazing site for us I think yeah. We ended up on a much more sort of bootstrapping course because we never really had any money and we were trying not to dilute. We ended up taking pubs and other venues with licenses which had an existing fit out and we didn't change it very much. We we redecorated and rebranded and put our offer in. And it became much more about a sort of simple, simple brand proposition and, gr- and r- most importantly, a really great team. Of course, one of the things that was happening at the same time related to this movement into sort of craftiness that started, you know, when people started, as I said, leaving professional jobs and going into food or drink or, you know, beer. Beer became a big one, as we said. So it meant that actually recruiting great people, if you had a credible beer offer, was actually not that hard because everyone wanted to learn about beer. Ultimately, that most of the people who came to work for us, their objective really was to learn about beer with us, learn about the market for beer, and then go off and set up their own brewery. A lot of people came to us, left, set up a brewery, or went to work for breweries. I mean, all of these guys, that was their objective. So for, for us, it was it was actually really easy to hire dynamic, you know, fun, mm. interesting, passionate, engaged kind of people. It was a huge plus. It meant that our pubs were just very different. We were always in, I mean, I wouldn't say C-level sites, but we were definitely sort of B-plus to B-minus. We, mm. ne- we had very few A locations, and we had a tiny site on the corner of Charlotte Street, which I think was our fifth site, but it was tiny but it was that was prime but other than, otherwise we didn't have any prime sites yeah. so we had to work really hard to build sort of loyal customers and and to get noticed where we were and and you know i think i think having having obviously i mean everyone always talks about having a great team and it's it's 100 true you know having a great team was was a huge part of it there came a time where you sold when we had three pubs which is probably a little bit early luke johnson the the sector investor uh came along and, and and bought a chunk of the business and became chairman. That that sparked a period where having everything having gone really well up until that point, because of course, as soon as we got some professional money and we started performing really badly and we couldn't find any sites to save our lives. And it was sort of at the beginning of what they call the space race in the UK, where everyone was trying to buy pubs, restaurants, you couldn't get anything. And it, we were a relatively small player and it was difficult to beat out the big boys when, when good sites would come up. We had to be very inventive with the kind of sites we were able to get. But I think we, we had a couple of years where it, where it became very difficult and also we, we we struggled with scale, so we, we were talking about this earlier on, but going from one to two to three was actually really difficult for us. And by the time we got to three and Luke invested, I think we weren't doing a very good job at actually delivering the promise of the brand with the with the customer experience. At that point, we hired someone actually out of Oaxaca or out of Nando's via Oaxaca called Suga Gunam, and she, she did a great job sort of as, as ops director, sort of professionalizing the business. And ultimately, when we got to sort of seven or eight sites. She went off and set up her own business and we hired a, a, an amazing guy called Richard Peachment out of J.D. Weatherspoons who brought some real discipline and backbone to the sort of pub side of the business and yeah. ultimately got a good FD, Barty Radix, because she'll be cross if I don't mention her name and it, as I mentioned Richard's name. Uh, <laughs> I saw them both last night and they're in great form. Yeah. Barty's now FD for Coffee Smiths yeah. and doing an amazing job there. And Richard runs uh, Market Tavern so they've all gone on to do happy things afterwards. What I found was the bigger the business got, the better people we could afford to employ and the more fun it became to run. My natural sweet spot was definitely not operations. I was not a natural operations guy. More interested in in the brand, in marketing, in property, in doing deals. I love raising money. I love working with investors. I love all that stuff. But I've got a very short attention span for repetitive tasks, monitoring, uh, performance, all that. I mean, I got better at it as we went along because I had to, my immediate reports, I had to kind of you know learn how to manage them. And actually, they taught me how to manage them, to be honest, because mm. I had no idea. They'd come out of you know, larger organizations where they had been properly managed. 
much. And I yeah. certainly, it, you know, left to my own devices, would just, just let them, you know, get on with it. But in fact, they taught me how to mention that was a huge plus. So we ended up with a great team. To answer the question you asked me before we went on air, which is, you know, how do you manage growth? I think I think you do have to keep, to a certain extent, adding to the team or reinventing a team because the, the challenges become so different as you get to scale. You sold out to the Scottish Brewery Group? Very end of 2017, we were up to, we'd, we'd just made an acquisition. It's a business called called Grand Union, which was a which was a sort of disco pub business. We acquired six sites. They, they'd sold their sort of some of their sites, and it ended up with six. And we bought the we bought the, the rump of the business. That was in summer of 2017. We were in the middle of doing those up, and we'd done we'd done about three of those up into draft houses, and we were sort of going to do the other three, and and. Uh, it was proving to be very, very challenging for anyone out there who's thinking of making an acquisition. A lot of people said to me, it's always much harder than you think. I can confirm it's always much harder. Well, it certainly was harder than we thought it was going to be. What, what was your learning about I think, buying another well, company? Well, I think, I think that when you're a relatively small business, and at this stage we were a business of 12, no, sorry, 10 pubs turning over about 11, 12 million. We were still a very small head office team. Buying the business took much longer than we thought it was going to do. So it, it, it took about six months. I was personally stuck in you know, offices, solicitor's offices eating biscuits, you know, when, when I should have been running the business. And But it was so compelling. It was fun as well. It was so compelling to be involved in this transaction. You know, I already have said I've got a short attention span and sort of, and, and uh, Luke often used to accuse me of being what he calls a neophile, which is someone who's always interested in new things, like a magpie. <laughs> uh, I mean, to a certain extent, I think he's probably right. So I got very distracted by yeah. you know, running out. So, so I think that in the run up to the acquisition, we 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 sort of as a management team, and my FD was obviously incredibly busy working on endless remodelings of the of the transaction and so on. We 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 got quite distracted. But the bit the performance of the business continued to be good until we started selling to Brewdog. So that 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 comes later. So yeah. so so we then bought it, and then and then we had a lot of as you as you allude. I mean, as you predict, we had we had a lot of people issues. It was a very very underinvested estate, and we knew that, but I think we underestimated estimated how underinvested it was. Yeah. And it required more money and more time to, to sort of turn around. And it, what looks good on a spreadsheet, which is essentially going from 10 pubs and saying, okay, we're going to get six pubs and we're going to open them all as draft houses. And it's just going to be, and then, you know, we're going to sail off merrily and do more. <laughs> uh, actually, six months of neglect, followed by a yeah. crazy period of adding pubs, still takes you away from the core estate. And then suddenly you then get an offer for the whole business, which is what then happened six months later at Christmas time, 2017. It was a challenge, you know. I very strongly believe that we were gonna gonna turn that around, and 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 uh, and, and and it was already you know showing evidence of, of turning around. But but it was just it was just a very very challenging period for the business. When we got the offer, I my immediate reaction was no because I felt the plan had always been to get to 30 pubs. And, you know, the numbers were exponentially larger when you got to 30 pubs. So I, I was thinking, well, why would I sell when I've only got 16? Luke Johnson said to me, well, you know, there are other things you can do. I mean, you don't have to just run draft house the rest of your life. So I thought about it and we negotiated a bit. And then I kind of thought, actually, maybe there are other things I can do in life. And, and I started to look, to look kind of forward. It's almost like when you're running your own business, you're so submerged in that world. It's the baby, you know? So yeah, and you just you just have no other perspective really, uh, and then as soon as you start looking out, it, it, it starts to look quite interesting. Or at least that was my experience, and and so uh, eventually, um, I think March 2018, we we did a deal with Brewdog, which is a great deal, and I think they've done an amazing job with the estate, and I think it has turned around as we as we said it would. It was a, definitely a challenging time, but when I came out of it, I was initially hugely confused by life because I'd be so used to particularly doing these two transactions back to back and the mania of all of that, and then suddenly I lost my email address, lost my mobile phone number, you know, all that stuff, and it's. It's like you've got no comms. It's like you've got a new phone, but it's like a brick because no one's got your number, you know? And, and you're used to just tons and tons and tons of communication coming in all the time. Yeah. And you're, you're tuned, your whole psyche is tuned to dealing with a no constant more. tidal wave of communication. And then when that all stops, it's, it's a very strange feeling. And you feel kind of completely numb. My dear friend, Jasper Reed, uh, who lives in New Delhi, rang me up when he read the news in Propel and said, Charlie, you're going to be majorly confused right now so why don't you come out to India on a busman's holiday come and have a look around some of my restaurants he has a, he has a Wendy's franchise in uh, in India mm. and uh, I don't know how an ex-McDonald's man feels about the square hamburger but anyway it's <laughs> another matter square hamburger in, 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 in India I think it's called an, an aloo burger and it's actually a fried mashed potato breaded fried mashed potato thing that sits in a yeah. in a in a bun with curry sauce on it and it gets sold for si sort of 6p I mean they sell millions of them I and mean, it's amazing business he's got in fact we're going back 
back out there in, in January to see them. Uh, and we had a lovely time. Sort of, we, we, we went round Delhi and then we went down to Bombay and we went to Pune. It was fabulous. Uh, and I saw this whole different world. I hadn't been to India since the 80s, completely transformed. I suddenly, I was completely awestruck by the scale of what had happened there in terms of development and so on. And uh, it was amazing. Uh, and I came back feeling refreshed and ready for a new challenge. And uh, that was how I sort of dealt with the aftermath of, of, yeah. of the sale, yeah. Without wanting to yeah. exaggerate, yeah. I mean, it's sort of, and it's all obviously first world problems, but, yeah. but yeah. Uh, it's a little bit of post-traumatic stress, I think, you yeah. know. Even now, being out of ops, I think when people send you an email, it's quite considered email. Yeah. And so they don't, you're not getting like thousands of emails every day, you're no. getting sort of 20 or 30 emails a day. The whole thing becomes less compelling in terms of you're not just constantly checking your phone to see if there's another email about the blue roll order, you know, that's, got, <laughs> yeah. that's gone missing. Or... No, beer. <laughs> no beer on the tap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no beer. Where's the beer? Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, And then you went into uh, the investor world and a TV show as well. Yeah. Million pound menu, my million pound menu. I had a few quid, not a lot of quid. I had a fairly big attitude, as you know, uh, and I thought that I had something to give. And so having so the business in end of March, gone to India, come back. I then booked out the whole of my autumn and I went away on holiday for a few months, which was really nice. I'd never done that before for that length of time. And then I came back and I just started having loads and loads and loads of meetings with tons of people. And my, my real objective was to you know make relatively small investments in businesses, but also to potentially take some options or growth shares and, and, and get involved in helping those businesses to set strategy, to raise money, to grow, and ultimately to sort of shape themselves for exit, if that's what we all agreed was the right thing to do. I met with lots of companies, lots of amazing businesses. And sitting here now, I mean, you know, I, I, I think I initially probably thought, I know I initially thought that I wanted to have sort of five or six NED roles or chairman roles or whatever. And I think it's too many. I think probably four is about the right number for me at the moment. And, and I've got two pretty much nailed down. So one of them is a breakfast club, which, yeah. you know, at the point of recording this podcast yeah. was announced uh, yesterday. Congratulations and, uh, on that. Thank you. To and that's you and very exciting. Club. So Jonathan Arana Morton is an amazing guy and you should get him in, actually. He's a he's a radical guy uh, and he'd be a fa- fascinating person for you to have on the show, particularly in the way they've built culture in that business, which is, I think, its its greatest mm. asset. It's, it's, it's yeah, staff culture. He's just been on Mark McCullough's. Uh, he has, I was going to uh, say. Mark, yeah. Mark and I, we are good friends. Good. Uh, well, I he's just we on are, the Mark, Supersonic podcast and it came out. It also came out yesterday and this, yeah. was, this was all part of a carefully planned uh, media campaign just done that deal with Jonathan at, at Breakfast Club very exciting and then quite close to another one in the fried chicken arena with a business called Butchies I can talk about it in fact I'm touching wood as I do but I'm, I'm normally quite <laughs> cautious about talking about deals that haven't been done but this one is in agreed form and I think it's, it's, it's a formality at this stage and by the time this comes out I very much hope it will have been done and I'm working with a founder called Garrett Fitzgerald who I know you've met a couple yeah, of times yeah. and I think the, the really interesting thing about the fried chicken space is we all love fried chicken. The world <laughs> loves fried chicken. That's yet, a couple of concepts that has proved that. And yet, for the aspirational consumer, I think there is still a certain element of dirtiness around fried chicken, whether it's from the sort of unbranded chicken shop or whether even KFC, I think there's, a, there's an element of resistance. I mean, unless you're drunk, in which case, you know, all bets are off. And of course, I think a lot of fried chicken is consumed after midnight. Yeah, we feel very strongly that we're not anticipating becoming a bigger business than Chick-fil-A or, or KFC. But at the same time, I think we feel there is a substantial niche for a business which can sell a higher welfare chicken with what we consider to be the best recipe in the market, pretty much based on a, a classic American QSR platform. I'm confident that if we can get that right and importantly get the brand right that, that we can we can do a lot of them in the UK it's essentially a, a small KFC unit model with, mm. with you know small premises eight you know starting with starting at 800 feet on ground we think that we can do well we know we can do a huge amount of volume out of that size unit and yet the break-even points incredibly low so they're highly profitable it's massive for delivery yeah. which and and because we're starting now I think we can build well we have built uh, delivery into the model for lots of reasons I'm I, I think fried chicken is quite interesting yes there are you know a number of other brands out there that have had a similar idea I think we're better but we're also smaller than most of them so you know we've got some ground to make up but yeah. but um, I'm excited about it and then you're still on the look I guess, than further opportunities. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's another couple of things that are that are under discussion at the moment. I mean, I've, you know, I th- I've probably met about 40 or 50 companies, not all of them with a view to investing, but just, to, you know, sort of getting a feeling for what's going on in the markets. I've always been somebody who's been quite gregarious in terms of getting to know people in the sector. I've always liked to go to industry events and meet people and hang out, got lots of friends in the business. So, so it's been good to catch up with all those people and have a bit more time to have considered conversations and learn about what's going on. It's a very challenging, very challenging time. Yeah. The industry is in the uh, perfect storm, I call it. Like mm. You have challenge around costs. 
you have workforce challenges, you mm. have technology to, you need to deploy or make mm. work mm. for, for, for the, your businesses. And then you have uh, uncertainty. Most businesses are either flat or declining a bit in growth. There's, of course, the, the people that, that break the curve. But in general, across the sector, there's, there's a flat lining or even dropping in sales. What is, what is your perspective on the industry where it is now? And where are we in five years from now with all the CBAs going on and stuff like that? Well, I, I'm an optimist. I like to think, and it's, it's easy to post-rationalize, but mm. I, like to, I like to think that it's understandable why what's happened has happened. And I think there was probably too much easy money around. There was probably too much spreadsheet-driven thinking around how to roll out a business. So, you know, you have 10 sites that are doing a million quid each, doing 20% unit level profit. And you think, okay, well, if we do 100, it's going to be the same. So let's just open another 90. And then we'll have a really big business, you know, return on capital 40%, you know, what, what's not to like, kind of forgetting that, you know, a founder found a led business with 10 sites, the cultural transition, in the end, mostly about people, the culture transition to go from 10 to 100 is immense. And also, you know, there are all kinds of challenges around how big is the market really for your brand. One of the things I really like about both The Breakfast Club and, and Butchies is my perception is that the, the, the possible opportunity for both of those brands in the UK, not to mention um, outside the UK, is large. And I can see, I mean, we're, we're for example, and we all know that, well, I think, well, we don't all know, but we, we can surmise p- perhaps that, that there's a market for fried chicken all over the UK. But, but Breakfast Club is already trading very well in, in, in Brighton and, um, yeah. and Oxford. See no reason why it shouldn't trade well in lots of other places. The reason I'm confident that we can do that is because, first of all, we're not trying to open hundreds of sites. You know, we're, we're trying to open maybe one, two, three, or yeah, possibly four, but that would be a lot of sites per year. We only want to open as many sites as, as, as we can while while looking after our culture. We're, you know, we're, Jonathan is immensely protective over his team and over the culture they've built in that business, which is, I mean, you know, they give, I mean, last year they gave 3,000 staff hours to local to local charities, just as an example. So, that, so the kind of people that you attract when you're running a business that has those kind of that kind of value system in in you know the world of Generation Z is amazing. But this this is not the kind of conversation you would have been having in 2014. You know, you would have been having a very different kind of conversation about getting to scale really quickly. Yeah. And you know, there are some businesses that have got to scale quickly over the years. Generally, they tend to be simpler in nature and maybe simpler in brand than. QSR? Uh, the, or, yeah, well, yeah. I think QSR, yeah. essentially, or even the likes of Weatherspoons, you know, you've got, yeah. you've got a very systematized culture in, in Weatherspoons. It's not really driven by, for example, team personality. It's driven no. by very, very clear standards the uh, machine, around yeah. The, the dictated, yeah. Yeah, quality, yeah. price, you know, cleanliness, really, yeah. consistency, these sorts of things, rather than, I don't know, Byron, which in my view was a business that was built on having amazing service. I mean, yeah. incredible service. Wonderful people working there. So when I used to go to Byron, you know, Tom Bing is a good friend. I used to go all the time. And all the men and women who worked there, for some reason, were incredibly good looking. They were all really nice. uh, And you just kept wanting to go back there, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think scaling that from wherever they were when they did the PE deal to 100 sites, which is what they eventually ended up doing, you just couldn't, couldn't do it. It just wasn't possible, and so they weren't able to really deliver on the brand promise. Business like McDonald's, when I've been myself, you are you're part of the machine, but you're not an integral part. You can be replaced yeah. because the system is in place to train others to do the yeah. similar job, even on corporate level. Yeah, no matter what. Yeah, there's many MDs that's walked away, and yeah. one has come up from the system, and it, they just take over. They they're ready to take over, and, and that's the fascinating part of those rollouts in a way, which I think mm. very few businesses can get to that scale and it's different times now than it was when McDonald's started yeah. commercializing restaurants in principle. It seems incredibly vainglorious to say it, but that's that's our hope for yeah. Butchies is that we can create that culture and, you know, a desire to systematize the business. And also, I mean the other thing that McDonald's has always had is a, is a, a tremendous culture of innovation and they've they've kept reinventing that business over and over again. And then we you know, even though we've only got two sites, I can hear Luke laughing if he ever listens to this, but we've <laughs> but we've 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 just we've just been through a sort of a root and branch kind of rebranding exercise which was was very necessary but it seems it seems again like a vainglorious thing to do when you've got two sites but I I think what we're really trying to do is to set the business up for growth so that we've got not only we got the operational systems but we've also got the comms and we know what it is we're saying we know what we represent and that can then be briefed into design it can be briefed into the kind of team we want to hire all that stuff so so we can start to really define all aspects of the business ahead of getting to you know 25 sites in the next in the next four or five years which is our 
which is our goal. It's also, in my view, we have seen some of the, the people that have successful gone a bit slower. They've been very good at defining their culture mm. in that way, and therefore they could scale the culture. Like Mowgli is a very mm. good example. Nisha mm. was on the podcast talking about this incredible organization that is actually, she is, she's not controlling this organization. That organization is telling her what to do mm. by their living their values and be very clear about what their purpose is and how they approach things and mm. wait going into London, if ever coming to London, because she can just do more outside London. That's a, her strategy and that, but that's also ingrained in all decisions they make. Smart to, to work out how to be successful outside London first, definitely, because I mean, it's just a much bigger opportunity than inside London and much easier to find sites. And But I mean, with Butchies, it, all the thinking starts from the base point for, for the brand is the street. You know, yeah. It started as a street food trader and yeah. we really wanted to anchor that brand in that history and because the, the people who did that are still running the business and this is, this is what they know. This is how they built the business. And so, yeah. You know, having that culture that comes out of the street, and it's urban music, it's all kinds of stuff that, that feeds off that. It's trying to give a sort of internal logic to that that the team can really get and wrap their heads around and, and be excited about. As I say, we just had a three-hour brand presentation this morning, uh, and it was genuinely quite exciting because we've, we've had a lot of, you know, shouting and headbanging about this thing. And so yeah. finally we got the, to see what, what the end result of that is. The first look. It's all starting to make sense. So, yeah, I think the systematizing is a key part of QSR, I think. Whereas I think Brexit is a much more organic, much more organic business. And that's what's really exciting about this. It's all about people, managing people. Two very different approaches, but, yeah. you know, both, I think, super valid. And founder-led businesses as well, which is quite interesting, which I think is another thing that's important in, in scale, that you have the mm. founders with you on that journey and they mm. are taking that lead from a culture point of view. We talked about before, and uh, that was like why we agreed to do the podcast. It's like, why is there no global British brand really really ruling the world like McDonald's and KFC and so on. Mm. And we talked about going to France and so on. And, and you have quite a, a perspective that you made. A, you did a well, piece a couple of months ago on, on going global. Yeah, uh, it's not a subject I know, know very much about. It's just something I wrote about from a, more of a sort of you know, mystified perspective as yeah. to why it's it, why it never happens. I think I think there are lots of reasons, and I think there are also some businesses that 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 you know have, are starting to show they've got some international legs, like Pret, like Nando's, and so on. And we had a couple here in the podcast. We had Swingers, Crazy Golf. Are they going? Out, are they going outside? They are yeah, going yeah. to New York, yeah, opening okay. next year. And Great. I met with the founders of Hawksball yeah. recently again to New York next Got year. Got a big well. project. Going into the stakes. Yeah, in love the those guys. Yeah. In the stake city. Mm. That's, a, that's, mm. a, that's a brave move. Very brave. Yeah. But Very yeah, brave. so there's there's people trying. And there's been a lot of been mm. people that tried, but they never really got it over the line and it took Pred a long time to get their, their operation. So I hear, yeah. I think there's an inherent suspicion among UK entrepreneurs, UK founders for franchising. And I think you know, it doesn't really happen without franchising. I, I just don't think it's possible to run a, a global business without operating partners on the ground who yeah. can help you to navigate you know, local culture and so on. And I think yeah. McDonald's has been amazing at that. And I know sometimes those relationships get very fraught and, and yeah. complex, but but at the same time, you know, I, I just don't see how else. And also just the, the sheer capital requirement to, mm. to, to roll out you know, however many tens of thousands of restaurants they now have. There are all these franchise businesses in the UK running franchise Costa, operators. I guess running, Co Costa, is, Costa is an example of... Yeah, uh, Costa is uh, a very good example. Yeah, yeah. Actually, Well, there we are. But there, there are also lots of franchise operators in the UK, you know, operating in KFC yeah. is operating, yeah. you know, all, all kinds of brands, but mostly brands that are coming from abroad. At some point, I, you, you've got to believe that it's going to go the other way, and I'm sure it will. But I know very little about the new wave of dessert bars. But you know, you've got brands like Creams, which I understand is mostly franchised yes. in the UK, and it's it's grown incredibly quickly. So who knows? But but and and I I, I find it hard to believe it won't happen. And I think I think the obvious market opportunity has got to be continental Europe, where you know they're just you know in a lot of countries in in in, in Europe, you've got a very old fashioned food culture. I mean, you look at provincial France, you look at Germany, you look at, you know, and, and you think there has to be an opportunity because most, I mean, my, my big point and the point I made in the piece is that millennials and Generation Z people are waking up in the morning with a lot of the same ideas about the world, probably a much more closely aligned set of ideas about the world than their parents would have done across national borders. I, I just don't believe that aspirational food and beverage brands can't work across borders in Europe. I mean, they absolutely can. And we've already seen it with QSR brands, obviously, in spades. So, um, you know, I just, I, I, I think it's going to happen. And it's just a question of who's going to be there to make it happen, you know. But I know that, for example, Robin at, uh, at Trispan is looking, you know, I mean, a couple of months ago, he mentioned to me that, that you know, that's something he's very interested in. It's, you know, well, how can we get you know, UK brands into Europe? And I, I think absolutely, of course, it's complicated. Of course, it's hard. But 
it has to be possible. And with that in mind, going a bit back to your, your own involvement in things, when you are looking at, you know, uh, potential investment. What are the success factors you're looking at? What is important for you when you look at something potentially investing in or coming aboard as advisor, NED, chairman? You know, there has to be, from both sides, there has to be an opportunity. There has to be a match of experience or skill or whatever. And I think, you know, for example, with Jonathan at Breakfast Club, I think, I hope he would admit, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure he would. That <laughs> we'll find he, out when he comes on the podcast. Well, yeah, exactly. But And he'll be listening. And, and um, I think jo- Jonathan has grown that business, you know, amazingly, but without any investor scrutiny. So you don't necessarily always know what good looks like uh, from, for example, a metrics point of view. Whereas, you know, having worked with Luke Johnson over many years, that's something that's, you know, very close to, to my heart is, is understanding, you know, what, what good numbers look like and, and, and understanding what some professional management looks like and all the rest of it. And so trying to, at, at breakfast, I'm trying to blend those two things together, preserve the culture and preserve what's made it great, but at the same time in, to introduce some of that kind of financial and systems type discipline into the business. Or not that it doesn't have any, it has a lot of, it has a lot of systems discipline, but it's, all of it is homegrown, which is amazing. But there are certain areas where, there, where, where you can make some, some, some improvements, mm. uh, particularly on, for example, margins, reporting, and so on. And I think we've already started to make some great progress on that. So I, I think, I think that would be the first point is, is, you know, there has to be, you have to be in sync in terms of what the opportunity is. Otherwise, you know, why would, you know, if I don't think I can move the dial in the business, mm. why would I, why would I get involved? Then I think the product itself is, is, is hugely important. So is it something where the perceived value in the market is, 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 it allows you to charge enough money that you can make a big margin? on it so you know I mean, obvious ones would be fried chicken pizza etc where where you know you're into the high 70s uh, on gp but you've still got a very affordable ticket price so yeah butchies has got six pound ticket price 20 percent more than kfc mm. but you know it drives some very high margins off that which gives you room to do delivery it gives you room to go into lots of different markets at that price point so i think that's important uh, is there a strong brand you know because in the end customers want to identify with what you're doing they want to, they want to feel aligned they want to feel generally i think unconsciously but i think that that sort of unconscious connection is is really really important and the founder would have to or the business would have to have either an existing brand or as in the case of butchies we'd want to be able to evolve what is already a, a, a strong brand into something that, I, that that really has legs and build something that, that in my view anyway, would have a, a major connection across across lots in lots of different sort of demographic groups. I, I, I don't want something that's sort of narrowly focused on a cool market, you yeah. know, like, yeah. It's going to do well in Hackney, but maybe not well anywhere else. You know uh, that, that there's doesn't. Some concept they would uh, they will never come out of Hackney. No, and I uh, and I uh, that's that's of no interest whatsoever to me. Um, it's not a small thing that landlords should like you. I mean, is it a brand that landlords? You know, the comms that you, you mm-hmm. know your reputation. Uh, you know, it's if if you haven't got a brand that landlords are impressed by, then it's difficult to get sites. Then if you if you can't get sites, you know, what are you doing? You know, yeah, maybe not immediately. Although we're already seeing some of it, but I think that. The, and you and I have talked about this in the past, but I think the, the you know a willingness to embrace tech and yeah. uh, understanding how uh, robotics will impact on on food production. I mean, you know, let's face it. I mean, it isn't getting it's never going to get cheaper to make food in this country. You know, it, no. it's getting more and more and more complex. Yeah. Compliance aspect is getting more and more complex. Yeah. People side of it is getting more and more expensive uh, yeah. and complex. Yeah. It's getting harder and harder just to hire people. So in the end, you know, I think we're going to have to whatever the model is, we're going to have to be able to you know introduce an element of of automation into into you know or a great I mean I know we- Weatherspoon is amazing at this for example but yeah. and obviously your former employer yeah. uh, is amazing at it so I think that's really important you know a, an ability to scale to open sites where you know there is actually a really high uh, return on capital so you know forty plus percent has to be it just doesn't make any sense otherwise and and I think finally and I'm sure I've left out some points but I think something that is 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 quite often forgotten in in small scale businesses is, is how important it is to make a net profit you know i mean mm. lots of businesses talk about adjusted ebitda or they talk yeah. about you know whatever it is and draft house is certainly one of them you know in the current climate if you're not making a net profit forget it because n- net profit doesn't lie no nope. you know, you, that's, you, you, uh, that's if what's going on in the business if there's a plus at the bottom of, of the column now you know, that's i mean butchie's is a net profitable business with two sites. You know yeah. that's just incredible. You know, yeah, based on very well done, the yeah. history of of every business I've ever looked at in the sector, yeah. very few of them are are net profitable. You know, getting to that point quickly and staying there is is I mean it's hard, but is it, 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 there's no choice. People have always written off depreciation, amortization, but we've learned in this 
in this car crash that we're in at the moment that those are real numbers. You know, they're not non-cash items; they're cash items. So just no, the cash may not have to be paid now, but the cash will have to be paid at some point on you know on renewals and so on. Because also that proves if the customers and the employees love and support that business mm. often, that you know you you can be at that point not for a certain period of time. You're constantly making profit. Not too small, but you're actually you're showing your ability to make profit. And I think there's so many that forgot about that in that race as well, the importance of making profit, because that's where the starting point is. And then you can do all these amazing things when you have your profit to invest in in great experience and so on and so on. And that, that's often that's forgotten in that race. I talked with a guy last week, and he's he's a, he's an accountant. He works for a big accounting company to work with the sector. And he said, like, there's not many businesses that, that hits the mark right now mm. for a five-year outlook if they continue. Mm. And that's quite scary, mm. in a way. And yeah. there have been some surprises on where people said, "What happened there?" You know, they and mm. CBA. What happened there? You mm. know, because everybody thought mm. they were a very successful business. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. Although I am very optimistic mm. uh, about the sector, I think that but spend every- is still growing, and admittedly, yeah. a, admittedly, a lot of it is, is is delivery. I mean, one of the really incredible things about Breakfast Club is we're in sort of you know mid single digit like for like growth. Yeah. With, without delivery, we don't do delivery. We don't. Mm. I mean, Breakfast Club doesn't believe delivery is good for its brand. It still values the the face to face experience of, yeah. of bricks and mortar, and it's almost unique in that. I mean, everyone else is is, is piling into the, into the delivery market, other than loungers, <laughs> which is the other one that 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 refuses to do delivery. And and, and you know, we're too busy at, at Breakfast Club. You know, the way we're set up, we're too busy to do delivery well. You yeah. know, which is a nice problem to have. What, one of the things that, that that happened to me after I sold the business was um, I got approached by some headhunters about meeting private equity firms, and I went round and saw probably six or eight private equity firms. And yeah, and obviously the thing I know about is you know hospitality, and and they of course were all <laughs> trying to work out how to get as far away from hospitality and get out of their existing <laughs> investments if they had any. If, yeah. they, if they didn't have any, you know, they weren't interested in getting in. And I think it's you know, as I said, there are reasons you can see you can. You know, after the event, you can see why a lot of these car crashes happened, and there's a whole load of reasons. And even even if the boom had continued, you know, the level of rent that was being paid, yeah. the actual modelling itself was never really focusing on properly taking into account the cost of building out those sites and then amortising them over the lifetime of those assets. And so yeah. you were never really looking at you know the kind of successful model that you really needed to to, to properly drive cash returns in, in in those businesses. You know, with the new reality that we're that we're all facing, and it's amazing how now when I talk to entrepreneurs who are in the space, they're all talking about doing what Draft House did only because we didn't have any money uh, yeah. back in the day, which was to you know find sites which have got existing fit out. Of course, there are lots of people yeah. coming out of sites now. There are some fully fitted, beautiful sites, as you yeah. say. You know, when we made my million pound menu, the TV program, we made it in a in a in a bankrupt Byron in Manchester. You know. That was that yeah. was where they that was where they they did the restaurant trials. I, th- I think and so therefore the, the return on capital, you know, if let's say you you know you create a site and it does a million quid a year and makes two hundred grand and you might have got into that site for two hundred grand, mm. two hundred and fifty grand, you know. I mean, that might actually be quite a lot if there's existing ventilation, existing yeah. kitchen equipment, existing layout, existing furniture, and you're clever about how you can reposition that space yeah. from a brand point of view. Yeah. You could be looking at a hundred percent return yeah. on capital, and suddenly. The business becomes very exciting. So, so I, so that's why I'm kind of optimistic, because I think there are for, for brands that, that that have got traction in this market, that understand the market, and are not just big swinging dicks running around trying to spend as much money as possible on each site. I think there's plenty of money to be made, and I think there's plenty of growth to be had. And I think ultimately the private equity merry-go-round will come back, will come back around again. And uh, they normally yeah. do. Yeah, I think they will, and 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 rightly so. I mean, I think, and I think, hopefully, the bubble having burst will lead to um, a more sensible kind of expansion models. And as we've talked about earlier on with Breakfast Club, butchers, yeah. etc. You know, so and the new new innovation, new people, yeah, by the, the yeah the, on the deck. No, totally. As well. I I definitely meet some very interesting founders from professions that normally wouldn't have been seen in the industry. Mm. 20 years ago where you know you you grew up in it now there's coming people in from technology the big uh, management companies and so on so yeah very interesting the last thing I would like to uh, hear your view on is that at the end of the podcast we always ask the guests if they could give one advice to leaders out there in the industry or maybe people that are thinking about joining the industry what would your one advice be make money every damn day people forget about making money they get confused make money and then all the other problems fall away just yeah. everything you do. It doesn't, it doesn't mean it's all about making money, but you just have to remember that. 
Yeah, yeah. because the money is the uh, fuel to the, the, the boss. Yeah, so. and it, you know, I, it doesn't mean that you can't do lots of good things in your business. It, yeah. it doesn't mean you're not going to make mistakes. It doesn't mean any of that. But if you no. focus on building a model that's sustainable and can make really strong margins and really strong return on capital, then then uh, and, uh, and as we said, uh, a net profit, then I think, and all the other things we talked about, yeah. aid that process. But ultimately, if you don't do that, yeah. forget it. Not yeah, it's happen. one of the one of the mm. keystones. And it's right, just, yeah. just people people get distracted yeah. from that, and then they panic and they cut costs. Yeah, and then they and they don't build it into the they don't build high profitability into the model from the start. Yep. And once you start cutting costs from an existing model, then you are into a death spiral generally, yeah. and that doesn't work. Build it in at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it fits really well because there's one of the circles in Jim Collins' uh, book, Good to Great, they call mm. the hedgehog yeah. concept. It's like, uh, do something you really care about, or really believe you can become the best in, yeah. and then uh, make sure it's something that can make money yeah. as well yeah. as, as one of them, and, ma- and make sure that uh, you know you 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 can build you know a really strong momentum around that those mm. three circles, and then you the flywheel, the flywheel effect. And yeah, then you, you can. I, I like that book. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people would say, and they'd be absolutely right. You know, do something a passionate about make sure what you what's grounded in your own personality that yeah. you feel comfortable around what you're doing and it comes naturally to you yeah. so you can channel your own personality through it you know i think of people like tim martin at weatherspoons i think you know he's channeling his own incredibly strong personality through that business through yeah. the, his belief in brexit through you know all kinds of stuff which which you know is 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 also you know resonates very deeply with his customer base and and, and the whole thing and you think you know wow you know that's like a force of nature going through that business and yeah. it's a very good example of someone who's like utterly not, yeah. but they, they They've got a very clear idea of, 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 of value. Mm. And actually, they don't mind because part of their model is not making a ton of money per site. It's it's about scale. So they, they don't have huge margins, but they've got a very sustainable, fast-growing business. Anyway, blah, so, blah, blah. So the one advice, <laughs> summing up, profitability trumps everything. Yeah. Thank you very much, In the Charlie. current market, yeah. Yeah, in the yeah. current market. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Charlie, for coming to the Hospitality Maverick podcast. Good luck with the new appointment in the Breakfast Club and all the other things you're up to and we'll tune in very soon I guess then. Wonderful. Thanks Michael. Thank you Charlie for sharing your journey the importance of net profit and how to navigate the current storm in the industry. If you have enjoyed today's podcast please give us a like, share, rate, subscribe to one of our channels. Thanks to Let's Talk Video Production for your help making these podcasts great. Also thanks to Experience 101 supporting us getting this out to more movers, shakers and mavericks. And if you have not yet signed up to the event, do the right thing on the 18th of March in London. Get on to experience101.live and get your tickets today. You can also find the link in this episode's notes. Tune in next time for another industry interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us and subscribe to our newsletter at hospitalitymavericks.com. Thanks for listening and be maverick.